We're looking at the different Sundays in Advent and the stories around the birth of Jesus Christ, the King, the Messiah. We told you that Matthew uh, is addressed to the Jews and presents Jesus as the King in the royal line of Judaism. That's why there's a genealogy and so much other Jewish information in the book of Matthew. Mark does not even take into account the birth of Jesus Christ. In fact, only in Matthew and Luke do you really find the story of the birth of Jesus Christ. But Mark is written to the Romans, and uh, Jesus is presented as the perfect servant. Luke, written by a Greek physician, is written to the Greeks, and Jesus is presented as the perfect man. You know, the Greeks designed the Olympics, and they were very, very uh, interested in um, uh, physical dynamics and being able to uh, really elevate uh, the physical body in person. John is the gospel, it's the most general. Uh, does anybody know what Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called as gospels? Anybody, there's a word for it. Anybody, what's that? Synoptic, very good, excellent, yeah. The synoptic gospels, and John is different from the rest and so those three, and the reason it's called synoptic is because we get the word synonym from that, and they're very similar, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John is completely different, addressed to the whole world, Jesus as the Son of God and the perfect Savior. And so today we're looking at uh, a continuation of the birth of Jesus Christ in Luke's story. And we pick it up where our Advent reading was in Luke chapter 2 and verse 8. And it says, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone. And I want you to see this, because wherever angels appear, there's human comparison and frailty. Wherever angels appear, there's human fear, but wherever angels appear, they show off the glory of God. And so this glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified, these shepherds. But the angel said to them, and this is what the angel always says, said to Joseph, said to Mary, uh, says to others when Gabriel usually appears to them, and this is probably Gabriel, do not be afraid. Um, the splendor of angels, while they're not to be worshipped, is something like you and I have never seen. But the splendor of angels is pale in comparison to the glory and the power of God. And so that's one of the reasons the angels say, you know, don't worship us and don't be afraid in our presence. We're just messengers. Uh, we're created beings uh, in, different from humanity, but still created beings. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. This is news for all the generations. This is news for time and history. This is news for all of eternity. There in that little town of Bethlehem. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. And this angel clearly said he is the Messiah. Now, if you're not from a Jewish background, that won't mean much to you. But that word, Messiah, Mashiach, is the word that they were looking forward to, that this is the one who would deliver. This is the one who would rescue the nation of Israel. So this is what they were looking forward to. And every good Jew from the time of Abraham, the father of the Jews on, through Joseph and Jacob and, and all the others, they look forward to this coming of the Messiah. They didn't know all the details, but they put their faith in this coming of the Messiah. And here, at a point in history, the first century was probably the only time in human history that there were a minimum, and I say a minimum, of wars. It was a time of relative peace because of the Roman um, government. And they were able, in this, in this particular century, it was, uh, they were able to um, have a, a relative control and relative peace for this to take place. Continue in Luke chapter 2, verse 12. This will be a sign to you. 
you will find this Messiah, this baby, wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, if you thought there were angels before, now there's a lot of angels. A great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying. So you have myriads and myriads of angels there appearing with all their glory in the sky, announcing this and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. So what was the purpose of this Messiah? Well, the angels announced it. Peace on earth, on whom his favor rests. Well, who does God's favor rest on? Everyone who inhabits earth through time and eternity. That's what God wanted to do because he created us and he wanted us back in a relationship with him. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So these shepherds, and incidentally, shepherds were not the, um, well, let's put it this way. You wouldn't want to be around them. Uh, they didn't bathe very often. They smelled like the animals they cared for. Um, they were not highly regarded. And why did God choose them? Why did God appear to all the kings and all the royalty and all the uh, rich people? Because shepherds represented common working people. The people that God had such a heart for. And he, he also appeared to kings. We know the Magi came. And so the whole spectrum of humanity is covered by God's great announcement of his Messiah because his peace on earth is for all of humanity. Verse 2 and, and uh, chapter 2 and verse 16. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. Now, the shepherds couldn't help but talk. What would you do if you went out one night and an angel appeared to you and talked to you and then heavenly hosts came and gave you this big announcement? Would you say, well, I better keep that secret. I'm never, I'm never telling that to anybody. No, you'd blab it all over the place because it's like, it's never happened to you before. It's such a special thing. And this is, this is what the shepherds, and these shepherds were, were apparently Jewish believing shepherds looking for the Messiah as well. And that's why they went out and spread the word. Verse 19, but in contrast, Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds spread the word, Mary kept it for now to herself and was thinking about these things. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. So their story from Luke was an accurate story. And then verse two, chapter two, verse 21, on the eighth day when it was time to circumcise the child, Jesus was eight days old, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he was conceived. Now I want you to see something that happens here. Because Luke now has them return to Nazareth. Luke doesn't say anything about them going to Egypt. Matthew says they went to Egypt for a couple of years, being warned by an angel to escape Herod. So some people have said, well, Luke and Matthew conflict. So you can't trust the Gospels. You can't trust their accounts because they have conflicting stories. No, they don't have conflicting stories. Have you ever told a story and depending on who you're talking to, you left out certain details because you knew they wouldn't be interested in that. I was doing that last, last night at a Christmas party. I was talking to a guy, and we are talking about the big snowstorm we had last year with 40 inches. And uh, I started to tell him the story about the tractor that I have that I bought probably five, six years ago. 
And I brought it home and my wife was upset with me because she said it doesn't have a bucket on the front of it. And in, in very kind words, she says, what kind of person would buy a tractor without a bucket? It's useless. I said, well, but I can mow grass with it. And she's like, yeah, but what are you going to do in the winter? I said, well, it's got a back plow on it. Okay. So, and, and I see you're doing some of what this guy did last night. I started telling him this story about how now for this year I'm in good shape because I found a bucket for the front of it. And his eyes were glazing over. And I'm thinking to myself, I should just leave that rest of that part out of that story because he's not interested. And I can see by the look on your eyes, you're not that interested either. However, this is what Luke and Matthew are doing. The best way to explain it is Luke is a physician writing to the Greeks, and it's not important to escape Herod in his account. Whereas with Matthew, it's important to record that because this is the overthrow of one monarch, one king, Herod, so that Matthew could establish excuse me, could establish the kingship of Jesus Christ. And so all of that was important. So it wasn't that it didn't happen, it's just that, that Luke didn't feel the need to tell that story. So in Luke's mind, Jesus was born, he was circumcised, he went to Nazareth. But there was a space of a couple years in there that Luke doesn't even bother to, to talk about. That's the way the gospel writers would do it. It's not a conflict, it's not an error. Let's look at Matthew's story. The escape to Egypt after the visit from the Magi. Luke doesn't talk about the Magi either. He only talks about the shepherds. Matthew's the only one. Why would Matthew talk about the Magi but not Luke? Because Matthew is establishing that Jesus is royalty. And so kings would come to honor him. Luke didn't care so much about that. Matthew chapter 2 and verse 3, when they had gone, that is the Magi, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. Why? Well, I'm going to give you some history in a moment about Herod. He was pretty vicious. He killed his own son. So... Chapter 2, verse 14 of Matthew. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. He was down there for a few years. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. Now this is an Old Testament reference, and it doesn't specifically talk about Messiah. It talks about Israel as a nation, but often that interchange between Israel as a nation and the Messiah, uh, the prophets would just, just kind of intermix those. And so this is a quote that Matthew, as a Jew, picks up from the Old Testament and says, you know, it was said that my son was going to come out of Egypt. This Messiah was going to come, I called out of Egypt. Well, guess who else was called out of Egypt? The nation of Israel. So it's a picture that is going on in this situation with the Exodus and the nation of Israel, but also with the Messiah coming out and rescuing. And these are like puzzle pieces that the prophets and the gospel writers put together. Bible knowledge commentary. This is a reference to Hosea 11.1, 1, which does not seem to be a prophecy in the sense of a prediction. Hosea was writing of God's calling Israel out of Egypt, referencing back to the Exodus. Matthew, however, gave new understanding to these words. Matthew viewed this experience as Messiah being identified with the nation. So we go to Matthew chapter 2 and verse 16. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Jerusalem and its vicinity who were two years old and under. So there was a slaughter there in Bethlehem in accordance with the time that he had learned from the Magi. Then what was fulfilled through the prophet Jeremiah, what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. In Matthew 22, verse 18, 
quotes Jeremiah and says, A voice in her is heard in Ramah, that's the area there, by Bethlehem, weeping and great mourning. Rachel, who was considered one of the mothers of the Jews, weeping for her children, so he's talking about those around the area of Bethlehem, and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Herod was vicious, there's no doubt about it. Again, the Bible Knowledge Commentary. I, I hate to rely so much on the Bible Knowledge Commentary, but it is one of the best resources you'll ever get your hands on uh, for explaining the scriptures. The statement in Jeremiah 31 verse 15 referred initially to the weeping of the nation as a result of the death of children at the time of the Babylonian captivity in 586 BC. We've talked here a lot about the Babylonian captivity in church. But the parallels of the situation at this time was obvious, for again, children were being slaughtered at the hands of non-Jews, Herod. Also, Rachel's tomb was near Bethlehem, and Rachel was considered by many to be the mother of the nation. That is why she was seen weeping over these children's deaths. So a New Testament writer will pick up something from the Old Testament that had to do with captivity and another slaughter and reference it and bring it down to what happened at the time of Jesus. If you don't think the Bible is brilliantly put together and inspired by God, you're missing the whole point of the Bible. And then we talk about the return to Nazareth from Matthew chapter 2, verse 19. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. So this is where you pick up Luke, because now they're going back, and they're going to be in Nazareth after that time gap. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea, in place of his father, Herod, Herod died, Archelaus uh, took his place. We're going to explain some of this in a minute. He was afraid to go there. Now, Judea is in the south where Bethlehem and Jerusalem are. So he was afraid to go there. So he went instead to the north of Israel in Galilee where you'd find Nazareth, which would be his home, uh, his, his residence, even though his place of birth was in Bethlehem in the south. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophet that he would be called a Nazarene. Jesus would be called a Nazarene, not a Nazarite. John the Baptist was a Nazarite. A Nazarite was like Samson who took what was called a Nazarite vow. You never drank any wine, you wouldn't uh, cut your hair, uh, you know, the whole story of Samson, where he got his strength. He was a Nazarite. John the Baptist was a Nazarite. Uh, but Christ was called a Nazarene because he was from Nazareth. I like history, you can tell that. Bible knowledge commentary again. Nazareth was the town which housed the Roman garrison for the northern regions of Galilee. Therefore, most Jews would not have any associations with that city. Nazareth was considered a really bad pagan city um, up there by in the province of Galilee. In fact, those who lived in Nazareth were thought of as compromisers who consorted with the enemy, the Romans. So if a Jew in Nazareth consorted with the Romans or even had any association with the Romans, they were considered enemies. Therefore, to call one a Nazarene was to use the term of contempt. So because Joseph and his family settled in Nazareth, the Messiah was later despised and considered contemptible in the eyes of many in Israel. This is interesting. This was Nathaniel's reaction. Remember, Nathaniel was one of the followers of, of Jesus. When he heard Jesus was from Nazareth, in John chapter 1, verse 46, here what is what Nathaniel said. Can any good thing come from there? Basically, he was saying, that's a slum town. That's a terrible town. That's where the enemy is. That's where the Roman garrison is. There are, there's no way a Messiah could come from there. 
And so, uh, of course, Nathaniel uh, ended up following Jesus Christ, but, but that was the mentality about Nazareth. So it was even harder for people uh, to, to uh, respect and instead despise Jesus because he came from Nazareth. Let me look, let you look at this. This is their journey, okay? Uh, birth of Jesus Christ, Jerusalem, Bethlehem area. And then what happens is they go down into Egypt and then later come back. And you see you've got, this is Judea, this is Samaria, and then in the north area by the Sea of Galilee, you have Galilee. And so very north, uh, it's actually kind of beautiful up there, uh, but very north by Nazareth is where, is where they settled. To give you some history from uh, uh, BelieverStudy.com, Herod Archelaus, all right, this is, this is the son of Herod, was the older brother of Herod Antipas. And both were sons born to King Herod and Malthais, a Samaritan woman. So he had a, a marriage to a Samaritan woman who was one of his ten wives. Four days before his death in 4 BC, King Herod changed his will to make Archelaus his heir instead of Antipas. After he died, Archelaus, Antipas, or Antipas, some people say, but Antipas, and their half-brother Philip went to Rome and argued over their dead father's will before Caesar Augustus. Family stuff going on again. Who divided Herod's kingdom among them and gave Archelaus about half of it, comprised of Samaria, Judea, Idumea, which is the non-Jewish region just south of Judea. Antipas received Galilee and Perea up there in the north which runs along the Jordan River on its east side from about halfway between the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea to about halfway down the Dead Sea. And Philip received Iteria and Trachonitis, both of which lie northeast of Galilee. Now you won't remember those names and it really doesn't matter. Augustus withheld the title king from Archelaus and instead named him Ethnarch, which means ruler of an ethnic group Promotion to king would follow if Archelaus, then just 18 years old, proved himself an able ruler. Archelaus did not. Now this is when they're returning to Nazareth, Mary and Joseph, because Archelaus is in charge there. So Augustus removed him from power in 6 AD, turned his territory into a Roman province of Judea to be under direct Roman rule, and banished Archelaus to Gaul, France today where he died in 18 AD. So there's a lot of politics. I know your eyes are glazing over. There's a lot of politics going on. And let me show you, uh, this is where Herod Antipas had this area in Galilee. Um, this is where Judea became a, a Roman procurator. Uh, and then over here you had uh, Perea, some of those areas, and then you had um, Philip up here in the north where we ended up having like Caesarea Philippi, which is a beautiful, beautiful area, lush with waterfalls and everything else. So that's how Herod's kingdom got divided up at this time. So if you look at the birth of Jesus Christ and history, here's what I want to conclude with, without, with all this detail. God worked in human history to raise up and take down rulers, both good and evil, for one main purpose. To spare and protect the nation that would bring us the Messiah, Israel. And then to work in history so that the Prince of Peace would return and rule his world. And God is still working at that. If you look at the political scene and you say to yourself, wow, this is nuts, nobody's in control. Well, flash back to Rome. Rulers were killing their sons and daughters for political reasons. 
they were cheating their brothers and sisters and others out of rulership rights. Stuff was coming top down from the Caesars. It was a chaos. Taxes were high. There were more poor people than you could shake a stick at. And then there were extremely rich people as well. Does that sound familiar? Does it sound like what we're going through, other nations of the world are going through? And yet in the midst of it all, God accomplished his purpose. He brought the Messiah. He brought Jesus Christ to be born in that special place in Bethlehem. To live his life, to go to Nazareth, live out his life, learn the trade of carpenter, go to the cross, be raised again, and one day, because God is still manipulating and God is still holding history intact and our future intact, one day, that same Jesus Christ is coming back as Prince of Peace, King of Kings, and those who suffered, those who were treated badly, those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ are going to rule and reign with him in perfect peace and justice. In our chaotic world, that's something to hold on to. That's what gives Christmas meaning. Not just what happened in the past, but what's going to happen in the future. And you're going to be a part of it. If you know Christ as Savior, you're going to be a big, big part of it. And God says, live your life in light of that. Live your life. Mary kept and treasured all these things to herself. Treasure these things in your mind and heart. 